and welcome to this uh, today's ed edition of Havering Means Business. Uh, we've got an amazing guest uh, coming on the show today, uh, Laura from Jolly Strategic. And we're going to be talking uh, actually about a lot of things we talked about during the interview. We talked about uh, vulnerability in business, we talked about the human side and making sure we're doing things to make sure that we are living the best life and using the money as a tool to do that, which certainly Laura does when she supports business owners to get to a point where they are, um, they're running their business and we do when we have conversations with people about their own wealth. Um, and there's a couple, before we get on to the interview with Laura, there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk through with you um, just to um, help you do that. So firstly um, our white paper is now live it's out it's available um, if you go to www.savannahfp forward slash white dash paper you'll be able to get access to it immediately um, and i'll make sure that russ um, puts a link in the show notes below so that you can get direct access to that white paper we'd love to hear your thoughts we've put loads of time effort and energy writing about how we've done the research involved in um, helping people understand a little bit about what's going on in their lives in terms of change, but also um, a really useful technique that you can use to work out where you are now, where you want to be, and how you're gonna how you're gonna get there, and why actually that's a constant and consistent process. You know, once you get to one point then it's what's next. So it's it's having a process in place that you can just, every time, just make sure that you're you're doing that. And we share a tool we use at Savello to help our clients do that. And I think you'll find it uh, massively useful. The other thing I wanted to mention was um, one thing we talk about quite a lot with Laura uh, during our interview that, that we're going to play later on is having clarity over your numbers. And what I thought it might be useful to do is before we get on to the interview with Laura, talk about um, some of the numbers that it's really useful to be super clear on. Okay, So what numbers to get grips of your finances and get control of your finances should you be super clear on? Now I'd start with a really simple one. Um, it's income and expenditure. So what, do you, what have you got coming in every month and what do you spend? Um, because that helps you not only plan for today because it gives you an understanding of what you might need to change, but also plan for the future. Now you can do that in a number of ways. You know, some people uh, do it on a spreadsheet, some people uh, use software, you need a budget is one that you can use, and there's a bunch of software apps available. Some people are really old school and they get their bank statements and, 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 and sort of get a pad and paper and, and see where their income and expenditure is. Regardless of how you do it, having a really good income of um, what you spend every month and what you've got coming in every month is important. But in addition to that, what categories do you spend in? So how much do you spend on clothes? How much do you spend on uh, socialising? How much do you spend on sort of travel? You know, probably less in 2020 than 2019 is the, is the factual answer. But the important thing is having that framework in place to go, right, I know, I know how much I've got coming in. I know how much I'm spending here's where I could potentially increase my income and that might be through a side hustle, part-time job or whatever, or reduce my expenditure. Um, and, and you might want to do that because you want that gap to be increased so that you can either do more of the stuff you want to do or save for the future you. So income and expenditure, working out how much you've got coming in and, and what you've got coming out every month is fundamental to making sure that you are financially healthy. Now, I'm not saying as well that you need to check that every day, because you don't. Um, but do it once, and then review it on a monthly basis. If you get paid monthly, do it on a monthly basis. Um, and if you're, if you're a business owner, definitely do it in your business, and that's something Laura will talk about uh, uh, later on in our interview, but definitely do a personal one as well. So how much do you draw from the business, and how much do you spend personally? 
Now, why is income and expenditure important? Well, it's important to understand and get a grip of your money today and understand where you are today. But it's also important for your future because having a budget plan uh, of income and expenditure then allows you to take the next step. And that next step is what am I going to need when I decide to take the next step into my future? And that might be retirement, that might be a combination of both retirement and um, a combination of both retirement and a little bit of work. Um, but what tends to happen is that you're in a position where, certainly with a lot of our clients, they get to a point where they go, right, I'm going to make some changes, uh, I need my income to be this um, to make those changes, because I certainly need that income continuing to come back in. Now, a couple of really important points to make. Certainly the income you need now if you're in your 40s, and I'll use me as an example. So, it, so the income that I need, I've got two daughters that are still dependent on me. I've got a mortgage, although that's going pretty soon. I've got expenses that I won't have by the time I decide to take the next step and, um, and slow down with work or do something that that, that, that isn't related to the business. So the reason you need to do an expenditure both now and in the future is because the one in the future will be different because you'll probably have less liabilities to pay, less loans, credit cards, mortgages to pay, and you might have less dependence. However, one thing that we find our clients underestimate time and time again is the fact that, yes, you've got elements that you don't need to um, continue to pay, but you've got this bucket of time that you've got to fill um, that you need to think about what you want to do with. Now, certainly, the bucket of time I feel when I make when I'm going to make some changes in my life is spent with travel. Um, that travel is uh, certainly at least for the first 10, 15 years is going to be a lot more expensive. So, my part of my plan is how do I make sure that uh, my expenditure meets the needs for the travel I want to do. Okay, so first step is income and expenditure. Second step is expenditure, but based on the life you want to live in the future. Once you've got there, you want to then look at the income you're going to get in the future. Now, income can come from a bunch of different places. It could come from continued work. Um, certainly always take into account the fact that if you pay national insurance contributions, um, you, you're, you're more than likely to get a state pension. And certainly when you're getting to an income point, you want to be thinking, uh, how do I um, calculate my state pension contribution and, 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 and doing that? Good news is there's a state if you're sort of if you, if you're in a position where you're unsure there's a state pension calculator that you can use that tells you exactly how much you're entitled to um, and any gaps and the work you need to do and that's certainly worth um, applying for. Plus, bear in mind that you might have um, money that's coming from a trust that you might be getting paid or you might have. Um, you might have pension income, like final salary, defined benefits pension income. So if I take, use me as an example again, because I used to work for the banks and there was a lot of final salary pensions that I were, was a member of, I've got a few of those that are going to provide me with an income. Actually, it isn't sufficient to give me the life I want, but provide me with an income to make sure that I can live the life that I want. And that's your next step. So income and expenditure, uh, expenditure after I decide to slow down and stop work, income that I know I'm going to get, regardless of me working or not, after I'm going to I'm going to slow down and stop work. Next step is assets. So when you're looking at um, assets, and bear in mind that I'm t I'm going to talk in this video a little less about liabilities because certainly if you've got loads of liabilities and you're approaching a time where you want to make some changes, you need to focus on the impact of those liabilities on your life. Um, but I'm assuming that if you're 55 plus, um, coming into your 50s, your liabilities uh, might be slowly reducing. But the reason you look at your assets is you look at them to say, 
is the pot of money I've accumulated, knowing what the gap in income and expenditure I need to fill is, is that pot of money I've accumulated going to be enough to last me the rest of, our, rest of my life? Now, if your income in retirement, whatever that looks like for you, is going to be greater than expenditure, you don't need to worry. You know, your pot could be a pound and it doesn't matter. Um, you'd want to probably want to keep a cash reserve to, to be sure you're going to be okay. But most people... Um, need to draw down from their own. Most people we see certainly need to draw down from the wealth they've accumulated to continue to live their life. A <clears throat> couple of really important points when it comes to assets. Um, firstly, you're in a position where a lot of people say, my house is worth I know, 800 grand, uh, I'm, I'm going to rely on that to retire. Firstly, Number one, bear in mind that getting access to the capital in a house can be done now because you can do it through uh, releasing equity and um, uh, you know uh, and, and some of the arrangements that are around getting money out of the property. Um, but it shouldn't be your first port of call um, because number one, the earlier you do it, the debt rolls up. If you, if you do it in a certain way, and it could get a really expensive route to provide your income over time. And secondly, even though your property is maybe worth a lot of money, you're also in a position where if you're taking a decent level of income every year, you're really going to be drawing down on that amount. Um, and you need to work out whether that's going to be enough. So typically, when we're building financial plans for our clients, we don't use their main home as an asset, because typically most clients say to us, Look, I want to make sure I live there for the rest of my life. Like, I pay my mortgage, I don't want any more borrowing on it. We know it's there in case we need it, but we're not reliant on it for the full plan. But assets that you might potentially use are uh, pensions you've saved, uh, money in the bank, investments, um, a capital outcome from a business sale. That's certainly one that a lot of our clients use. And bear in mind as well with that, that um, other clients who, who have come in to me and said, Chris, I'm going to retire, I'm going to get a million quid uh, from my business, um, and, and I'm, I've got some pensions as well that I'm going to use. <clears throat> and then my approach is, what's that million pound, two million, whatever the debt value uh, definition is, what's, how did you get to that? And typically the answer is, it's because it's what it's worth and it's because it's what I want. Well, frankly, if you're selling your business, the important thing isn't what you want. Um, the important thing is what the market's prepared to pay for that. And certainly when you're thinking about building your business, that's what you need to, to, to look at. What is the market prepared to pay for um, to purchase your business? What are, the peop what are other people in your sector selling for? How do we make sure that we're in a position where you're, you're getting that value? But also all the other assets that you can use to supplement that income. Now, why are those numbers so important? Income and expenditure not only allows you to understand a little bit more about what you might be able to save every month for that financial goal, but also allows you to design a life in the future that you want to achieve. Anticipated income in retirement or when you make changes to your life is the next step. And that's important because you're then in a position where you're um, working out really what you'll need for, for the financial future you want and deserve. Number three is um, number, no, number three is what income you're going to get. So state pension, final salary pension. Are there any other incomes that you're going to get that fill that gap? And number four is asset. So if, if there's still a gap between the income you expect when you retire or when you do something different um, and stop work, you're then in a position where you need to work out that the assets are going to last long, long enough. <clears throat> Remembering that unless you borrow more money off your house, it's unlikely that that's going to be used as the main asset to provide the income and including everything sale of business, savings, investment, pensions. Now, there's loads of numbers that you can look at when you're building your financial plan. And with the help and support of a good financial planner, they can do that. But the starting point to get clarity is really easy. Income, expenditure, anticipated income, uh, expected 
expenditure um, and how much you've got in your pot to make sure that any gap between expected income and expected expenditure is filled. Hopefully that's useful. I'm going to uh, link to the link to La uh, Laura's interview. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us on Cervelo Live. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, life's been a bit busy, but it's all good because it's Friday. It is Friday. We are recording this on a Friday. It's coming out on Monday, but we're recording this on a on a Friday. And we before we came on, we had a quick conversation about your keyboard. Is it a keyboard or a piano? It, it's, I think it's a keyboard, but um, yeah, I, I say I'm learning piano, so... Yeah, as we said, that hasn't really done a lot in the last month. I've, uh, I'm taking a break, but it's uh, yeah. It's, it's an really aspiration, fun. right? Yeah, and it's and it's weird learning as an adult. I did a bit when I was younger, but um, yeah, learning something completely new as an adult, it's been just over a year, is is a whole new challenge. I've got this aspiration to sort of play like jazz quite seamlessly what's your aspiration for your piano learning i think it's just to be able to read a piece of music um i feel i'm quite liking classical which is interesting because okay. uh, i never would have put myself in that category um but it's just to read a bit and be able to play it and and just relax into it um, yeah and maybe maybe show off to fam fam friends and family a little yeah bit when well. people come around just having it in the in the kit bag to get out right yeah, no, I like that. And it looks good on Zoom calls, so, you know. <laughs> Clearly. Well, look, I mean, it's either that or the bookshelf, right? So I think, <laughs> I think you've, you've, you've just... I, I, I've got all of my Zoom calls at the minute are just the back of where my desk... Uh, just as a starter for 10, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, I am called Laura. I live in Essex, have been for all my life. Uh, I'm passionate about well-being, uh, mental health, exercise, you know, mind, body and soul. So I kind of try to bring that into most areas of my life. I have a Josh who is 12 and pretty awesome. So, okay. yeah, he keeps me entertained and, uh, and chilled out. Uh, so my career-wise, I became an accountant because I didn't want to work Saturdays. And the other office job I got offered meant that I had to work on a Saturday. So I didn't become an estate agent and I became an accountant, um, <laughs> which is, yeah, looking back, an odd way to get into it. You know what, though? I think most of us, even though we enjoy what we do, fall into what we do, right? Unless you've got a sort of burning career aspiration when you're young. And my my 16-year-old, as has, she decided from a couple of years ago, she wants to be a journalist and that's what she's going to do. I didn't have a clue at 18, let alone 16. You know, it's just... I don't, how, how about Josh? Does he know what he wants to do yet? Oh, yeah, he's going to... Okay, okay. It's it, that that's a that's a tough t tough market, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, I'm encouraging him to follow his dreams. Hundred percent. Uh, yeah. You know, but making sure that he's got obviously the academic stuff to back him up as well. So. Yeah, no, that's yeah. right. Um, yeah. And and tell us a little bit about your business. No, actually, before we do that, let me ask you about the how the. So you mentioned about the well-being, the fitness, doing things, looking at situations a bit more holistically, because interestingly, that's one of the things that we focus on on Cervelo. It's not just about the money, it's about the life and linking the money to the life. How does that manifest itself in the work you do? Yeah, so although I you know, take a financial kind of stance on things, I think that links into everything and everything links into finances. You know, it's the whole commercial picture. Um, you know, everything is interlinked. Everything impacts on everything. So I think, you know, getting the finances sorted and getting the financial visibility and businesses looking at strategy 
has a knock-on impact and then it means that you know the culture of the team is better people are happy and yeah it all just links into one i think i think one of the things that we find is often having conversations about money in the uk is still still it's a boom mm. but part of the challenge of that is then that doesn't give you visibility on where you are to make important decisions about your life and as soon as you've got that visibility you're in a position where you can make some decisions that might mean you work less or might mean that you know you've got clarity and i think that's where that visibility of of, of not ignoring the money but but actually having a real good sort of handle on your numbers is really important, right? Yeah, it is. In in personal life, in business, you know, it's it's that get your head out of the sand and, and know it because once you see the picture, then, you know, you're more likely to change things that influence it rather than just, you know, pretending that it's not there and, you know, you make decisions and you don't know why you're making them. So... Yeah, I, I think it's really important and, it, you know, it surprises me so much the amount of businesses that go into and they just don't know their numbers, yeah. you know. They're like, oh, well, I've got these accounts from months ago. It's like, mm, okay, well, I've yeah. got cash in the bank. Yeah, but, you know, what does that mean and how does that impact on the future and what happens if you do X, Y and Z? Yeah, 100%. And, and is that cash in the bank all accounted for by your... Your, your debtors and your creditors, you know, you know they, are you taking those sort of things into account? So talk to me a little bit about um, your business. Okay, so I um, set up my business about a year ago. I just got my big girl pants on and decided to go it alone. Um, I wanted to influence um, and I wanted to use my ideas and kind of my way of, of doing things because I think when you're in the corporate environment you know you, you have to toe the line um, at some point and and kind of fit into the culture and the vision of the, of the businesses you're with so um, I yeah I, I kind of went it alone um, just before Covid struck didn't see that one coming like most people um, and have weathered the storm and come out the other side and I think you know what it's really taught me is resilience because yeah. you know mm -hmm. it's not easy I mean it's not easy for anybody at the moment um, but you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to just keep going and you know it's 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 so true yeah, so we, we, it's interesting, we launched Cervelo, it wasn't called Cervelo back then, but we launched Cervelo back in 2008. Um, and at the time, same, same, same as launching a business now, it was the worst time to do it because the world was in free fall. Um, but actually, as you say, you b tend to build up those skills that you need um, as a business owner because you start to get pretty resilient pretty quick, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's been, yeah, it's been a tough year, um, as it as it has been for everybody. And you know, I think I've learned a lot of things about myself. And you know, I do have this kind of growth mindset. And you know, I've realised how resilient I am. And at points, you know, I haven't felt great, and it has been really tough. Um, you know, especially at the beginning of this, you know, March, April businesses that I was talking to, working with, you know, they went quiet um, and, you know, like everybody kind of felt like the world was, was, was ending and it yeah. was, yeah, pretty bad. So, you know, I'm really pleased to come out the other side, to be working with some fantastic organisations and adding value and helping them, you know, on the journey for the future. You know, you know what's interesting, I don't know if you find this as well, because when I look at resilience, I find that sometimes that, like, resilience in other areas of my life, like physical resilience, help me mentally. Have you, like, I know you spoke at the start of the interview about having a degree of balance. Do you, do you, what do you do outside of work to help you build that resilience? just about keeping yourself healthy in so many different ways so you know I love nature I love going for walks um, and I love being near the sea you know we're in Brightling Sea here and um, even this morning I just popped 
down the prom, had a little wander around, you know, took deep breaths. Um, I love exercise. I'm passionate about, you know, keeping physically fit because I think that definitely has a knock-on effect to your mind. And it's, you know, it's just sort of adopting all these good approaches in, in every part of your life. You know, there's not one thing that I can say, right, do this and you're going to be fine. Um, and, you know, we're all unique. So yeah. Yeah. taking different things. Yeah, spot on. So I know your work with business owners at the minute at a particularly challenging time for potentially for their business. What are the mm. questions you're finding are coming up time and time again from these business leaders about the future of their business and how can you help them solve those those particular challenges? Yeah, I mean, because there's so much uncertainty, so it's a lot of it is, well, we don't know what's happening, so how can we plan? And, you know, I have to encourage them to look at different scenarios and what ifs and, you know, just planning for kind of what you think at that time or what you think is a possibility. Um, but doing nothing is not an option. You know, they're, yeah. they're head in the sand. And I, I try not to work with, um, with people that have that mindset because... It just doesn't really fit in with with my values, and I yeah. find that I can't really, you know, help them that much because if they're glass half full, then you know it, it doesn't. It yeah, doesn't it just you, you don't want to work with them longer term. I suppose I suppose part of the challenge, and again, we take a similar approach. We work with the clients we like, and actually. <clears throat> Uh, the reason for that is because uh, the reason for being more selective about working with clients is because we do want that long-term relationship where our values and outlook on life are aligned and it's never going to be perfect but it's you you so you sort of want to get as close to as possible I don't know whether I would have been brave enough to do it in my first two years of business so was that decision you made up front um and if so, what made you get to that point? I think because I've, um, yeah, I've managed my mental well-being quite a lot over the years, and you know, had different therapists to support me, and I've applied a lot of techniques that I use to keep myself, you know, healthy. Um, so a lot of stuff that I've worked or has worked in my personal life, and that just transfers over to business. Yeah. So. You know, if I feel like people are draining my energy, you know, I'll try to use my skills to, you know, make it work for me. And at the end of the day, if if I'm picking up early signs that somebody is not... He's going to be a dry, me, yeah. Yeah, then, you know, you, I think sometimes it happens naturally that you kind of, you know, you go your separate ways. Because if, you know, they're not going to feel like they're gel with you either, Um and, you know, there's, again, there's always a balance because we need our income. So um, you just have to take each case as it comes. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. So um, in terms of that, in terms of that unknown quantity at the minute, the fact that we don't know what the future looks like, I mean, I suppose I suppose there's an argument to say we never know what the future, future looks like, but what... Help me understand how you're you're taking an approach with business clients where you're saying, you know, what what scenarios do you potentially test to make sure that they might be a bit more optimistic about the future? I think it's just having those open conversations and understanding, you know, what their problems are and what their worries are. And, you know, it's back to what we said at the start. It's that whole holistic approach to things. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was um, advising a business recently and talking about, you know, when they make redundancies and whether they do, because, you know, there's so many different things that impinge on that. Um, you know, when business comes back, they're going to need these people. So we don't want to just make them all redundant, pay them loads of money, and then we might need to re-employ them at a later stage. You know, and yeah. Things like that. And I think you have to really, it's not just a cut or dry, you know, decision, yes or no. And yeah. once we kind of talk through things like that, you know, it was like, well, let's look at each individual and let's look at their values for business. Let's look at how, you know, easy it would be to recruit somebody like them. And, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And like you said, that's, you know, that 
does happen all the time, not just in this situation. It's just on a larger scale, I think. Yeah, cha- change is the is the only constant, isn't it? That's the reality of it. You know, change is going to happen. It's just 2020 has been a year of pretty full <laughs> of pretty significant change. <laughs> Um, but also with that change for a lot of businesses, it's really interesting. I don't know if you've found this, but for our business, we had a really slow start to lockdown in terms of new clients. Um, but in the last two to three months, we've now had an influx of clients come in as people start reevaluating their life and thinking, I need to get my money in order to work out whether what I'm planning next is going to be financially feasible. So we're we're one of the lucky businesses up thinking in in all of this, and there are there are potential winners and losers, aren't there, in in a situation like this? Certainly, you know, one of one of my clients runs a commercial cleaning business. He's in a position where a lot of his um, stuff is for the London Underground, and his contracts have taken a slide because the demand for for cleaning on the Underground has extended a bit because of the COVID requirements, but less because of the uh, footfall. Um, uh, But but certainly catering and sort of hospitality has taken a bit of a downslide. However, for a lot of businesses, they're using this as an opportunity to buy other businesses as well, to, to, to yeah. negotiate business purchases. And I know that that's one of the areas that you focus on. So tell me a bit about what's going on in that space. Yeah, I think, you know, the fundamental kind of rules are, you know, they're still in place. You know, why... Why do you want to acquire the business? Is it because you want to um, absorb it into your business? So then you've got to look at, you know, the cultural fit and all that kind of stuff. Is it because you want to um, grow your group for a future sale? Um, you know, what are your objectives? And have you actually got the passion for it? Because, yeah, it's a lovely idea, you know, acquiring businesses and kind of being a multimillionaire and having all these plans. But you know, where are you at in your stage of life and yeah. what is it you want? Because it's a lot of extra hassle. Um, yeah. You know, the, the rewards are, are, are huge, but, yeah, do you, do you want to go that step? And I suppose the other interesting thing for professional services businesses like you and I is if you acquire a business, how do you know that those clients are going to be aligned to um, your values as an acquirer? I mean, it's certainly... We've had offers to buy businesses that we've said no to because I didn't think the the business that have, have approached us to buy has been aligned. So how do you how, what do you do about that? If you're advising a business that says I'm not sure whether this is the right move, what what key considerations are you, should, should businesses look at when they acquire? Yeah, so it's you know it's doing your homework and it's it's getting some good due diligence work at you know if you get to that stage where you need to check out all of the financial aspects commercial aspects because you know in a negotiation you're going to need to to know all those facts um at the beginning obviously the leaders and owners will tell you exactly what they want you to know yeah but yeah it's one it's once you actually have a look and uh, see what's actually going on beneath the surface but you know there's I think a lot of it is instinct. Um, You know, you build up a trust, I think, when you're acquiring a business. And it's about the people that are in the room and the people you're talking to and, you know, how involved they are in the business. Yeah, okay. And and I I suppose one of the things that we've spoken about before and one of the things that I talk quite a lot about is clarity gives you a power. It gives you a power to know where you are so if you know where your goals are, you know where your financial situation is, and this is within your business or personally, and then what it, that allows you to do is identify the gap in between the two that you can then gradually, not instantly, but gradually start to fill. That starts with getting the data right, getting the information about your current financial situation right. In your experience, what are the key numbers that are business needs to have to make sure they can make important decisions yeah so it, it's using it's using all that data turning it into useful management information um, which obviously varies business to business it's, um, it's making sure that the numbers stack up I mean you know, the, 
the key important in bits of information are, you know, what's your profit, what's your yeah. turnover, what are your costs? Um, but you have to look beneath that as to, okay, well, how are we accounting for, for turnover? Because are we taking sales in the right period, etc.? And, you know, hopefully there's a, a trusted finance team who are getting that right. Um, but it's, it's about once you sort of start interrogating the numbers and looking at the key performance indicators and, you know, what actually drives your business, um, and then you start to ask questions and then you can see, you know, does the picture stack up? Does it all make sense? Or is there something that needs amending? Yeah, and and in terms of in terms of the uh, in in terms of a lot of the business businesses you look at or work with, where where's the common gaps in that? In terms, is it is it is it they've got the data but they don't do the sort of deep dive of analysis, or is it they they do the analysis and don't know what to do with it? Where is the actual gap in terms of what they do? Well, this is one of my big passions and drives for doing you know doing what I'm doing and and where I've been in my career because the amount of businesses that I have worked for and am now working with they just don't know their numbers and it shocks me because it's not complicated no. I mean, people make it complicated you know oh we can't get this and we do, you know we we kind of can't have this information. Um, I mean, management information should be available at the touch of a button. 100%. You know, within three working days of the month end. You know, that that should happen. And, you know, I've implemented that in businesses that I've worked in before. So I know, you know, that all of the people saying, oh, we can't do that because, you know, the WOD doesn't provide that information and we can't possibly do that. I mean, you can do it. You know, like big, huge corporates are doing it, you know, and they are complicated beasts. So, you know, if, if they can do it, then an SME can totally do it. And um, I suppose the challenge you've got with that, and this is one thing that, um, that that always confuses me when I speak to people like you who, who work with these businesses all the time, can you afford to wait nine to 12 months where, if, you, if you're doing it in the old-fashioned way to make a decision about driving your business forward. And I don't think you can. No. Well, I mean, what's the point of having that information? I mean, yeah, if you just want to do a set of statutory accounts every year because you've got to do them, you know, that's up to you. But they're not the kind of businesses that I want to be working with. Yeah, because yeah. You need, you need to know, you need that visibility. You know, you need the picture. The 100%. commercial picture. Because otherwise, how can you, how can you make decisions? Um and how can you see how efficient or not efficient you're being unless you've got that information? I mean, it's it's just essential, um, yeah. and it it shocks me so, <laughs> time and time again. Yeah. So so without getting too geeky, as you know, I had an exam on Wednesday, and yeah. part part of part of my exam. This is getting way too geeky, Laura. We're, we're, we've lost to half our audience already, and I'm, I'm sure that audience is only two people. But um, that um, one of the things we talked about in the business, and this is something that um, we didn't used to apply, but we do now, is ratios. So, so one thing we we've got a grip of is what's our profit ratio. You know. What's our debt days and credit days? How long does it take for people to pay us and, and for us to pay other people? And looking at the trends within that business. And it's quite powerful stuff once you once you once you get the, the numbers right and once you get used to used to tracking it. Um, and I suppose that's the next step, isn't it? You know, get the raw data right, get it available within three days of the end of the month. And then analyse it to see what story it tells you about your business. Yeah, absolutely. There's no point having the having the information at your fingertips if you're not going to do anything with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the point is that um, you know I would look with a business owner or a business leader at the information and ask what the story is and drive the story and look at what that means and you know if we did this would that increase that would that decrease that um but you have to see what the picture is yeah. to know what you're trying to influence and what you're trying to change um, okay. and you know forecasting is is critical for businesses and 
you know, that should come out again within three working days and that should be, you know, you should know where you're heading because it's that, as you said, you know, it's... Have a plan. And it's, yeah, have a plan. Have a plan. What's the gap and how are you going to get there? Yeah, um, 100%. Yeah. Help, help, me, help me understand a little bit about what at what stage a business should be looking at outsourcing their FD. So th- there'll, there'll be businesses that are really big who are who have got their own finance teams and FDs. There'll be medium-sized businesses who might have a finance team to deal with their accounts but may not have somebody who holds them accountable on the numbers. And then you've got sort of smaller startups who are, who, who are at that stage. Now, I know you said... Um, before that part of the work you do is with startup businesses who are growing quickly but do you think a business needs to get a certain size to truly benefit from an outsourced fd no i i think you know for a start it's about having the right fd it's about having the right advisors just in general um i think all businesses would benefit from having you know that trusted advisor um, you know, from day one, uh, obviously you have to look at the cost benefit of that and, you know, whether it was just an hour a month from day one, you know, that's, that's the beauty of kind of being an outsourced FD because you can, you know, you can tailor Yeah, you can tailor it to what the client needs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a change. Um, and, you know, people, businesses think that they've got to get to a certain size before they make that next step because it's a big investment. Well, you know, people like me make it a little bit easier to make that step because you can do it on a, on a smaller basis. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, you know, it depends on the complexity of the business. It depends on what the plans are, you know, if they want to grow quickly and grow big, then, you know, putting a financial plan in from day one is, is essential. I've got a, a new um, startup client that I've just started working with, which is really interesting. And, you know, they've got these huge plans and, you know, I have no doubt that they will, they will achieve them. So helping them now to look at what their vision is and, you know, providing a bit of kind of coaching and, you know, just to be that sounding board yeah. and allowing them to take a step back and kind of be like, okay, this is where we're heading, you know, monthly review meetings, this is where we're at, these are our plans to get there. But that know. that's that's the other point I was going to talk to you about because I suppose a lot of it is about that accountability, isn't it? You know, having somebody external from the, to the business who's there to turn around and go, come on, we need to look at this. How important do you reckon that part of the yeah. process i mean certainly in our world just keeping people on track checking in for regular reviews uh, and even if there's nothing else just being that accountability partner is really important how yeah. much of a outsourced fd role do you think you know is, is that a component part of the role do you think i mean it, different it's, it's horses for courses isn't it you know different people provide different things and I know because of my background experience and you know what I'm passionate about that's part of part of the service that I can provide and actually that's probably the part that I find most rewarding yeah um, you know because I've got the kind of big picture view and you know it's not all about the detail I'm you know I step away from the detail and and hopefully other people have got that in hand um but it's looking and, and being that support for people and you know I, I need it. So I spoke to my business coach. We had a, an 8.30 Zoom call this morning and, you know, he allowed me to have a step back and think about what's happening in business and, you know, what are my challenges and how I'm going to overcome them. And, you know, we, we all need it. Yeah, 100%. So whether 100%. you're running a huge business or whether you're, you know, running a, a consultancy business like me, it's, you know, we're people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's it's a weird one because I I think that external accountability, regard in all areas of your life, from fitness to business to you know to to to, to having somebody to nudge you, saying look, we haven't got together as friends for a long time, is um, is is really important. Having having that sort of support network is fundamental. Now you mentioned about 
the fact that starting the business last year has been a particularly challenging year <laughs> with what's gone on. Um, but you've learned a lot across, across the way. What have you learned? What haven't I learned? <laughs> that, that's probably, all right, what haven't you learned? <laughs> <laughs> I've still not learned how to spend huge chunks of time alone. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all right for a certain period of time and I need my tranquility and, and peace and quiet and everything. But, you know, when it's kind of day after day, that, that was a lot. Um, well, it's it's funny. It's funny you should say that because I know that when we first got introduced, I it was that. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing clients in the office now, and I don't know whether the change in tier two rules. I mean, it shouldn't impact clients coming to see us, but I know I know when the guys from my office said, "Look, uh, uh, let's put something in the diary." We were both. Let's do it face to face because I haven't yeah. seen anybody in months. <laughs> Um, and, and there is that social element you want, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, I, I kind of thought for a while at the beginning of lockdown, I was like, you know, you've got this, you can do this, you know, monks do this, they're fine, they're fine on their own. And then I was just like, it's just not, you know, it's just not me. Um, yeah. So I realised that that's not me and I'm a social, social being. And while I've definitely um, become more accustomed to kind of, working from home and actually having that um, confinement, uh, I've definitely reinforced the fact that I like getting out and about and I need to see different things and different people. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of things that I've, I've learned. I think I've emerged more positive and optimistic. Um, I've definitely um, looked, I think, and realised about people businesses doing trying to have not having that hero mentality and breaking that down um because a lot of people want to do it on their own and you know kind of trudge through and everything and i think you know in business and in your personal life you need to kind of reach out 100 percent and ask for help so yeah it's reinforced that not maybe personally or a little bit personally, but more what I've seen through the whole lockdown experience. But the challenge you've got is that if you're a business owner of a of an SME, the business and personal overlap, and you you need to be mentally prepared. But also, you know, it's a weird one. And again, I, I didn't expect to have this conversation today. But for me, being able to be vulnerable and have conversations where either with, with its with, whether it's at the team here or at home or or with other people I'm asking for help from just saying I'm going to need your help to get through this is sometimes quite a challenge for us as human beings because we don't want to be perceived as being out of our depth um, but sometimes you need to do that and and the response you get is, in my experience, a lot better than you ever you ever realise, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, we all need to do it. And I think, you know, I, I thought I was better at doing it than it turns out that I am. Um, and I think, you know, I've done it in my personal life over the years and learned that, but in a business um, setting... It took me a long while to kind of be like, actually, I, you know, I think I do need help in this area and yeah. I do need help in that area. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm all for delegating, but I think it was more of a, okay, I've taken on this huge task of going it alone. Um, you know, I was kind of winging it a bit at the beginning. And, you know, actually, I probably do need to need some help in certain areas. Yeah. And gotcha. that's, that's hard to admit to yourself. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 Okay, so that's that's what you've realised about uh, where what what you haven't learned. What's the what's the top three lessons of what you realise now as a business owner that you didn't realise a year ago? Okay, um, I think it's the resilience, um, and a lot of people said to me, "It's going to be hard," you know, if you've got a plan and. You know what you're going to do if that happens. I was just like, no, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And then, you know, 
it really did test my, you know, even before COVID, um, it tested that resilience and that inner strength. Yeah. So, yeah, that's one thing that I've definitely, definitely learned. Um, and you've, I think you've either sort of got it or you haven't, maybe. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can develop it. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 got, I, I gave up. I, I nearly gave up six times in the first couple of years. It was really tough, and I think, I think, you know, just as you, as you say, you don't know until you're over it. Um, but um, now I'm particularly unemployable. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a position where this is it. I might as well carry on building and growing this because uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's, anybody's gonna, gonna give me a job. Well, that's what I tell myself to make sure that I carry on, I carry on working on the business. Yeah, um, that's like the, the down moments that I've had and I, I never seriously considered giving it up but purely because I was like I don't know what else I would do at this stage yeah. because I definitely don't want to go back to the corporate world you know so if I'd have given up it probably would have been to go off on a different business venture gotcha. um, but that would have you know been like starting all over again again <laughs> so, yeah 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 um, yeah, another thing that I've learned is to trust your instinct. I think I've spent um, quite a long time listening to people, and there's a lot of great people, you know, like yourself, Chris. There's a lot of people out there with great advice, um, but there's also a lot of people that just kind of steer you off course and yeah. potentially, you know, aren't a, a trusted source of advice or knowledge. Um, and in hindsight, there's a you know a few times that that kind of happened, yeah. and I probably knew, but you know I just kind of went along with it and thought, yeah, I'll do what they've said and everything. But okay, so that yeah. raises a really interesting question then. Yeah. What's the worst piece of advice you took that you now realise wasn't for you? Maybe not piece of advice that I actually took. Because I think I got to the to the stage of disregarding it. Um, but advice like, oh, you need to be over all the social media channels. You know, you need to do Twitter. You need to do Facebook. You need to. And I was kind of like, okay, right. If you say that, I need to do that. And then I looked at a few of them and I thought, but it doesn't really fit with my business. No. You know, and you know, maybe Twitter's one I'll explore in the future. Um, but just yeah i guess at that stage i did trust my gut but probably also because i had a lot of stuff going on and it was probably just another thing that got put on the list yeah. and then i'd realized by the time i got around to doing it that i didn't want to do everything because you know you can't do everything no. i think it you know we set ourselves huge challenges and you've just got to start somewhere and make that good and then build on it so it's interesting because because i had this i had this conversation um this morning actually i was running a, a a sort of a local networking event um helping out the chamber of d doing that and one of the questions that we uh, that i asked was because there was a, b a bit of a wide range of business in the room there was lawyers accountants um but there was also sort of lifestyle businesses and stuff like that so it was, it was quite a broad range and our approach to um marketing and networking has changed so social media we do on linkedin um tiny bit on twitter a bit on facebook um uh but it's all automated so it doesn't involve any involvement of time from me um and and that's the element you need to be careful of i think it's that involvement of time if you can systemize it and you've got some awareness out there but the other thing the other thing that that was really interesting is that my the where I spend my time has changed so at the start of my business I used to spend loads of time going out and meeting new people and now I've realized that what I need is deeper more trusting relationships with less people as opposed to just more relationships does that make sense yeah no it, it does it really does and I think they um they do, there are some people that teach that, you know, referral marketing, isn't it? And, um, you know, it, it is all about 
trust and if you're just meeting one person once and you're connected you haven't built trust have no you? and you know you know what's interesting i think particularly pertinent in our spaces so if somebody's going to come and talk to you about trusting you with their life savings that can't be a transient relationship. And if somebody's going to trust you with the future direction of your business, it's the same, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it, and it takes a while to build those relations. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's another thing that, um, you know, I can be quite impatient sometimes. And I think at the beginning of this journey, I was like, well, you know, they've met me once. They must, they must love me. <laughs> Yeah. Why am I not um, getting the call? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, then I had a little bit of an education around sales and, you know, how that all works. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I, I get it, you know. Yeah. They've, they've got to, yeah, you've got to trust somebody. And you're right, you're, with this showing vulnerability as well, you know, somebody actually opening up and giving you um, the insight into their business where they don't think it's performing that's quite hard to do yeah. and you're not just going to do that with with just somebody are you um, no. i yeah, think it takes time i think i think it's interesting that you're coming back to the vulnerability thing because i think we've probably lost clients over the years because we are a very human business right so so i think if we we are we're not a particularly good fit with trade city traders because there's a bit of a macho culture around that that doesn't fit with the way we want to work um but what it does mean is that the right clients come to us in the right way um yeah. and i think you you, know, you you use the analogy of that sort of big corporate accountancy i think you're absolutely right that will suit a lot of people um uh, but you've just got to find your own little sort of uh, yeah. tribe of clients you want to work with yeah, you have, and it's about being true to yourself. And you know, some of the advice that I've had over the last year has sort of steered me off course because that's what Bob's doing. Or yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? Yeah. No, it, it doesn't, and it is about your own brand and your own identity. And you know, look, I'm not, I'm certainly not there yet, but it's been a very steep learning curve. And you know, I'm glad to be where I am now because. It, you do kind of flounder a lot at the beginning. Yeah, uh, I don't think that stops. I'm 12 years in and still floundering. So uh, ex- ex- <laughs> no, ex- ex- expect that to continue. Expect that to continue. <laughs> um, no, I, I, but I, no, there's a genuine point there. I think there's always that element of, of, as you say, that progression. Do you know what I mean? You get to a point where you go, you know, we have developed as a business and we're doing okay but what's the next step and what's the next step and that 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 we've got an end game in plan as a business but effectively the 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 journey never ends and you keep on learning developing and growing and changing your mind as 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 uh, as time goes on so isn't that fun 100% that's why that, that's one of the reasons I get up in the morning because it's it is a challenge, yeah. you know. Why why would you? Um, and 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 I know you mentioned about Josh. It is Josh, isn't it? Yeah, Josh. Yeah, Josh. So I've got a Charlotte and a Sophie, and they're one of the reasons I get up in the morning um, and and come, as well as the challenge and the fact that um, uh, it, it was really weird. So I I've I've. Uh, I've I've literally last month re- come out of hospital for an ear operation that had me in for a couple of weeks, um, and literally I I did that talking about vulnerability. I wasn't particularly vulnerable because I did that typical bloke thing of saying, you know what, I'm going to go in for an op, and then two days later I'll be back to work. And it took me two and a half weeks to recover. Um, uh, uh, but. The weird thing was, I realised I'm definitely not designed to sit at home watching Netflix. You know, I love a bit of Netflix, but I need to be out uh, doing something. But the motivation mainly for me is, is family. What gets you up in the morning? Clearly it's Josh, but what was your other motivations? Yeah, Josh is saying to me that he needs me to make his lunch before school. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. That does it a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm done snoozing now. Um... I think just the variety that life brings, you know, like leaving, 
it was a huge decision to leave the corporate world, you know, after so many years of being an employee. And now I've done it, although it's challenging, it's, it's like there's a whole new world out there. Yeah. You know, the, the things that I'm exposed to now, which is why it's quite mentally exhausting at times, is because it's so many, it's so many new things and new avenues you didn't even know existed. You know, you meet all these amazing people that are doing incredible things. And, you know, it kind of, like, there's a huge, big, wide world out there. And although we can't necessarily travel a lot at the moment, um, it's, it's still there. And you get involved in so many different um, groups and you're just exposed to this whole new business world. Yeah, this community. Yeah. How yeah, do you it, pick, it though? It really is, and it's ignited something in me, which is fab. Amazing. So tell me about what's next. So what's next for you personally and what's next for Jala? So personally, um, Josh and I are going to be rehoming a dog at some point cool yeah we're, we're just waiting we've signed up to lots of different charities and yeah that's going to be a, a huge exciting have event. you have you decided on a breed well i have but josh disagrees so i don't know <laughs> we, we both love a, a labrador um, okay he's he's got one with his at his dad's house as well so he he loves them but he really wants a um, golden retriever oh they're amazing dogs yeah, they are. They just—I just don't know if they're a bit too hairy for me, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you could always we'll you you could always go hassle free and get a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could. Um, yeah, cats are lovely, but not quite sure. Yeah, they're not the same as dogs, though, are they? Dogs are just like sort of part of the fact. You know what? We we've, we've had our dog now for seven years. Seven years. I'm looking at Cassie over the over the desk to make sure I've got the timing right. But what we've have you got? Um, what uh, you know what I was just about to say there, Laura. What make is our dog? What breed is our dog, Cassie? <laughs> 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 it's um, Cocker Spaniel. Cocker Spaniel. Um, but he, he he's uh, even though I was um, not keen at the start. Like six months in, he's part of the family now, and uh, you, 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 dogs become that far more than any other animal, in my opinion. You know, you, a cat or a fish or a hamster doesn't become part of the family, but dogs definitely do. No, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really actually. That's the thing that I've been umming and ahhing about for about a year, and kind of like, oh, is it the right time? Is it not? And something recently has just made me think, just. I just want to do it. Cool. Uh, but now we have to wait. So that's the, that's the annoying yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. And what how about for the business? What's the future of the business? Yeah. For the business, it's, it's to keep building on, on what I feel I've created. Um, and I'd like to expand the team. Um, you know, there's, there's some people who are doing some outsourced work for me at the moment. Um, but to try and grow that, but not not massively over the yeah. next year because I, you know, I still want to consolidate what it what it is that I'm doing and yeah. make sure that's, you know, still of good quality and value. So I'd like to to grow steadily, um, but it'll be, you know, it's always about building the right team, isn't it? Hundred percent. It's sure. about the people. Yeah. Yeah. But just to keep spreading the word that you know, business can be simple. You can have simple information make great decisions it doesn't have to be complicated yeah don't ignore it because you think it's complicated make it simple and then focus on it yeah exactly <laughs> yeah gotcha um you can use it as a tagline i won't even charge you for it though uh though okay. that's, <laughs> that's right um but yeah thank you so much for joining us on on today's show i've really appreciated and i've really enjoyed chatting thanks it's been yeah it's been great um it's been really interesting and yeah, I, I've had to think on my feet a lot. Well, you know what the you know what the challenge is. I I, I always send our guests some questions, but it always goes off off the rails. Yeah. Uh, that probably says more about me, to be frank. But thanks for <laughs> thanks for rolling with it. As always.
So that was Laura. Laura was clearly amazing, um, and hopefully you got a lot of insight into what Laura does. Now, at the end of the interview, Laura did mention to me that she forgot to mention her contact details. So if you want to look at what Laura does, you can check her out at www.jolastrategic.com. And that's it for this week's Savello Live. Hope you've uh, had a lovely day. Uh, whenever you're watching this, um, it might have just start in the morning. But I um, hope, hope you have a lovely day. Um, hope you've enjoyed and got value from the conversations. And we'll see you next time on Savello Live. <laughs>